So again, as a reminder, today's regulations are basically the same as a century ago. Public councils and planning commissions and public meetings have to understand the regulations. And as such, they're, ex they're, they're kept simplistic. And they're kept simplistic for a reason, is they're not rocket science. And that, that's actually a good thing. If you don't understand the regulations as a common citizen, then you can't judge it. So unfortunately, it isn't rocket science. And because of that, they're intentionally kept simplistic. So in the U.S., we have a miles 5,280 feet, an acres 43,560, and uh, many streets are 66 feet wide. What is the reason, do you think, for these weird or odd numbers that we use? You know, the world's on metric, we're on this system. Well, it's because of this object here. And do you know what that object is? It's a surveyor's chain. A surveyor's chain was made of steel links. It was 66 feet long. And that way, the surveyor could just take a straight line and go 66 foot across the road, 66 foot across the road. That was the logic behind it. It wasn't because the horses had to have so much width between them to pass each other. It was because of that. And in the U.S., and I suspect worldwide, a lot of the reason the right-of-ways are as wide as they are is for similar reasons. Now, before computers, how long do you think it took to calculate a single corner if there was a curve involved? I'm talking about an intersection of a straight line with a curve, or worse, a curve with another curve. How long do you think that took? Well, uh, if you were really good, somewhere between 15 and 30 minutes for each lot corner. That's if you were really good. So the question is, before computers, why was the grid so common? Well, you didn't have time to compute it. So it was quicker to lay out a grid and simply go through all the swamps, which are now wetlands, remove the trees, and grade the site. So, I actually started in this business before computers existed, and I learned to hand draw and hand calculate, and this was the process. You had a coordinate on a piece of paper, and it was a assumed coordinate, meaning that we didn't have state plane or world coordinates. It, you would just pick a point and go, that's 5,000 north and 5,000 east. And then you would write that down on a piece of paper, and you would figure, well, that line you want to be 54 degrees, so I'm going to subtract that from 90, so I am at a 36-degree angle. And then I calculate by hand all of those lots, and I want to get to that next point of curve. So I would look into a log book. There's actually books like this, and look up the sign or trigonometry of 36, and come up with that number. Now, I had to do all of this in my head. There were no calculators. And then double check it. So then I would take that number times 509.26 and, and write down 299.38, add that to 5,000, and I would have the northing or north coordinate of that next point at 52.99 and draw it on the plan. In the log table, I would look up the cosine, which is 0.8. 0901, multiply that by hand in my head and on paper, come up with 411.996, add that, subtract that from 5,000, and get that point on the plan. All that for one point along a straight line. Then I'd go 90 degrees from that and repeat everything above to calculate the center point, swing the arc of the curve, and again having to subtract or add the degrees, minutes, seconds, and calculate the next point. But then most of the log tables were decimal degrees, and I would have to go then convert that, all for just those points. How long do you think that took? It could take, that plan there could take weeks or even months to calculate by hand. So the 90-degree angle between the line leading into the curve and then to the center point 
is tangent to that line. That's what that means. It's tangent. It's exactly 90 degrees. And the reason that's important is because not only did I have to calculate all this by hand, that someone in the government had to check all of it by hand. So it had to be done twice. And you can imagine how long that took. So you needed a bit of a straight line between curves so that you could figure out a direction. That's called a tangent. But you had to have that because everything you did was done by hand. And then the lot line radiated from the center of that curve, the swing in an angle, and that's called a radial line. So lot lines were perpendicular to the right away or radial to the right away primarily because it would take so long to calculate it and if you didn't do it, it would be nearly impossible to plat check it, at least not in a uh, reasonable time. So the question is, how did cities plat check the middle accuracy? Well, again, they had to manually check it cumbersome and slow. So if it took a month to calculate it, it could take a month to check it before it could be approved. So as we learned, we no longer have four points taking a tremendous amount of time when we could do 162 lot subdivision in less time it takes to calculate one single point. So we're, not, we're in a completely different era today. So we don't need plat checking anymore because it is just assumed that with the modern systems, everything is going to be correct. So the answer is no, we don't manually plan check anything today. So what regulations still exist in ordinances that have their basis in the past but are not relevant anymore? And the answer is any geometric requirement that were held over strictly for manual plan checking. Those include sidelines must be radial or perpendicular, tangents between curves, and street right-of-way being 66 feet wide. And that's why most modern development, even if they are curvilinear, are still very rigid in nature because we're holding on to things that have no basis today. It has the same basis as if we thought we were going to measure everything with that chain. So what drives opposition of the neighbors to the next development going in? And it's always going to be the desire for space. Those neighbors, if we're assuming it's an older development, it's probably less dense than the development going in today for a variety of reasons. So we assume that the neighbors don't want that in the backyard because it's going to be perceived as denser or less value. But that was because we were holding on to all of the stuff from the past. What you are going to use this system is, is not to look backwards, but to think forward, to think differently. And that's why you need to dedicate yourself to learn this system, because you certainly aren't going to be able to do this work if you are trying to do it with existing technologies that weren't intended to take the thinking forward. So that is why it's critical that you learn Land Mentor. Remember lesson one, recognizing waste? Well, that was the plan. In a new era, we're looking again to grab frontage along the land, which means we, can, we have to step away from a linear thinking and create a much more efficient design. In doing that, we're reducing infrastructure, and generally maintaining density. In this case, the before plan was so bad, we were able to gain density. But it's not about gaining density, and it should never be about gaining density over existing ways we're doing things. It should always be about gaining livability and value. Take our mind off of this density thing, but lower the construction costs, raise the value, product is the same price. And no CAD software can replicate this. Only you can. A person with a brain, the software can't think. It's very important that you understand that 
you have to make an effort, you have to think differently. If you don't want to make the effort, you'll be part of the problem. So, this is Transonin of the Air, the original drawing. We went ahead and traced everything and got a correct geometric model of that. The new design, as you can see, is significantly less street. So when you fill your site up with street, you have to have the smallest possible lot. So we reduce the street by 38%, or 16,807 8, 16, linear feet. So we gain 19 acres of land. So we've gained about 8% more land of the total land, which goes right back into lot size. We didn't gain density, we had the same density. So the land value, let's say is 40,000 an acre, we gain nearly three quarter million dollars in land value, but if the, uh, conservatively on the low side of street with utility mains and sidewalks are $600 a linear foot, and we reduce it by 16,807, we gained over $10 million that we freed up to have better landscaping, better architecture, more efficient architecture, more efficient materials, and so we freed up nearly $16,000 or over $15,000 per home. So everything we did was not to ask for less. Everything we did was to provide more, and that's what pays for all of these extra things to get a product that is the same price but a much better product in the same way you don't have a dial phone anymore you've got a smartphone so the traditional way to think is going back to the t-square and triangle and it will maximize density but will do so at the cost of maximizing streets infrastructure if we pull away from the boundaries and get a more meandering system to collect areas of the site, the nonlinear approach reduces and eliminates much of the waste we just demonstrated to you. It's not a logical th way to think, but it's the proper way to think. And because it's not intuitive and logical, you're not going to see it automated ever in software. The average lot size went up. The reduction of infrastructure plummeted. We lost two lots out of the 244. So it has to be buildable. It's not a concept car where you showed this future and then the car you deliver is much different. You have to deliver what you promise. The engineer and surveyor certainly is not going to do this quickly, but we're doing things in a fraction of the time that we did when I started in the business 50 years ago. So who cares? You're still doing this pretty quick. It has to be buildable. So what you show at a, to a developer is going to be their business plan. What you show to the city has to be buildable, as shown. Very important. So the way to think about this is that bubble of concrete that's about forty thousand dollars to build why is it needed it's because the engineers looking at the city regulations and he says the regulations require a 20-foot front yard setback that means that pavement has to be following the right-of-way which is 20 foot from the home and they need to stretch that home around to get an extra home around that curve now is it really needed? Can we just take the bubble out? Is that legal? And the answer is yes, because of a magic term that's in every regulation that's on the planet Earth. And that magic term is the word minimum. So as soon as the word minimum is in that regulation, you can assume you could go beyond the minimum. So. You're going to take and gain efficiency not by meeting the minimums or reducing them. You're going to exceed them. And that's a different way to think. An example would be a cul-de-sac. A typical cul-de-sac logic is what? It's a fire engine turnaround. It's the wrong radius. A fire engine can't turn a smaller radius than the city's minimum requirement for a cul-de-sac. And typically that's going to be filled in with a bunch of concrete or asphalt. 
If you make the radius larger and the fire engine can turn a larger radius, some magic appears. And that is, we'll pull the homes further away, we'll go one way around the cul-de-sac, which is how everybody's going to go. If you're in an area of snow country, snow's pushed to the island, not to the mailboxes. The wide walk extends through the neighborhood. You pick up a park. So what happens is you double the amount of cul-de-sac lots. It's no longer exclusive to the cul-de-sac people, but inclusive to the entire neighborhood to take advantage of. You pick up the park, and it's an identical density in this example. So you lose nothing, and you gain everything by doing one thing, and that is exceeding the minimums. The park can be landscaped. You can bring the grading to the center so you only have one inlet and use it for your low-impact design. You can do anything you want with that. And you didn't lose anything. You only gained. Another geometric difference is if you're along a golf course. Remember I showed you the Riyadh golf course where the homes fronted the golf course but no homes on the other side knew they were ever on a golf course? By pulling away from an amenity, you are creating view corridors and doubling or tripling your premium lots. In this case, the home that's on the lower left corner has a lake view. The furthest home from the lake has a lake view. Why? Because we're creating pullback view corridors. Another thing you could do is position the homes any way you want so you no longer have to rear homes along arterial or collector streets. You can front them. And when you front them, you don't have a street in the front and a major street in the back. You have a street in the front and a private backyard. But along the arterial street, you no longer have to screen it with walls because the homes create the character. And then we could expand space through a block. But the big thing is when you're looking out your window, you are no longer looking directly parallel and perpendicular to the home next door. Your view shed greatly expands from within the home. So not only are we increasing space on the outside, we're increasing it on the inside. Land use transitions. In the U.S., it works like this plan. This is an approved plan. Can you see the things wrong with this plan? This is the normal way to think. Name five things wrong with it. Just take a look at it a second. Five things. If you read Prefer B, you'd already know them, by the way. First of all, there's an ugly strip mall, commercial center on the north end there. All streets are disjointed. There's no flow to the neighborhood. The park location is to silence the neighborhoods and get the plat approved. That's 16 homes that influence where the park is. There's 550 homes on here. 16 homes get the park. So, just to get a yes vote, that's absurd. Entry level, highest density, cheapest homes define most of the neighborhood. Behind that is twin homes or duplex. That's the next price point up. And behind that, behind all of this, is hidden the single family. No one's going to know this is a single family neighborhood, but this is the typical way planners think, at least in the U.S. Lots of stop turns and accelerates. No walking connectivity to the open space. And an expensive drainage system because there's no space for surface flow on this rolling site. So the land use that we took and we uh, another developer bought it, had us replant it. We're using bay homes, which you'll learn that are in Proverbia, I think it's chapter 8, um, that uh, define the neighborhood as a residential along the perimeters without looking at garage doors. We sculpt the neighborhood, sculpted entrances so nothing is monotonous. Oversized cul-de-sacs we just talked about. Spacious meandering boulevard with coved homes meandering back and forth. The park area is now central to the population. Lower income townhomes are behind. They drive through a nicer neighborhood to get home. It's the opposite of the normal way to think. Neighborhood marketplace has eating and social areas behind it, not loading docks, over the ponds, so the commercials and amenity, and again, bay homes to find the neighborhood villages. Be beautiful meandering walks. Um, again, uh, lower price homes go through the higher price homes. The higher price homes are along the main street giving a feel of lower density. And we took 550 units, mostly townhomes, changed it to 700 units, mostly single family. And how is that possible? 
look at the reduction of street. That's how it's possible. So what about that transition between commercial and residential? Most suburban transition, again, you got commercial with the loading docks, and then you put the highest density of most people behind it. This is the front of a commercial strip mall in Charlotte, North Carolina. This is the rear. Very untypical, no loading docks. No one's parked back here. I'm assuming that's employee parking or extra parking. I'm standing behind a screening wall thinking, what's there so ugly that you have to screen it? Other the sides, luxury townhomes. I thought, what's all this cost? Why not get rid of it and then take the transition between commercial and multifamily and make it something special like Centennial Lakes here, which is the best kept secret in Minnesota. You won't read about this anywhere. It's one of the nicest developments in Minnesota. It's kind of a hidden secret. So when we design with commercial and residential being adjacent, we try to create something that works for both. Again, the commercial is going to have to have exposure. So you do have more of a strip mall for the success of the businesses, but we want to bring the back end as an amenity. So again, simple geometry depletes profits and burdens cities forever. And what's your task as a student serving the land development industry? If you want to go simple, learn things quick, have at it. If you want to do things, excel and do things better than anybody else, learn the system. We gain efficiency by exceeding minimums. That's a completely different way to think. Replication, CAD automation has dumbed down and destroyed the design. There is very little automation in here that will automate and replicate. We instead create automation to help you think to get the work out in a reasonable amount of time. Land use transitions should be reversed to be sustainable and isn't about time we slow down and think about quality instead of speed and how easy we can make it for city staff. And that's where Land Mentor comes in because it takes a fraction of the time to learn. It's much more powerful and it really frees up the otherwise burden you would take and, and go down that uh, simple road. So uh, th that's it for uh, lesson six and seven and then we'll continue on the next video.